Hello, my friends. How is everybody? Are you good? How are you, Elizabeth? Are you good? So, my darlings, we're going to begin. This is, the, this is the finale of the Slow Living Summit. I know, right? Right? I know. It's been amazing. It did. It went by fast. It went by fast. <laughs> so somebody just said this was the fastest slow living summit yet. I thought that was pretty funny. I actually feel this is a little, you know what, I'm going to sit down and be near you guys. I've been standing up here all dressed up, doing my thing. I'm going to take off my shoes and sit down here and be with you for a minute. Thanks. Thank you so much for taking time out of your lives and paying your rent and all the things that you have to do to be here with us and share this time and also to engage in this crazy experiment. Really appreciate you. I feel, <laughs> I feel really close to you guys right now. I just do. Um, and I'm going to just talk for a few minutes um, before I share with you um, some work that I do. This is the thing that I do. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, you want to switch slides? Oh yes, you know what, I was going to say a thing. Look at this slide that's behind my head right now, because the beautiful art that you've been looking at is art. This is very appropriate because I'm all about... Well, you'll see in a minute. Um, this is Art for the Heart, which uh, is, has been on display up until very recently at the Brattleboro Memorial Hospital in the cardiology department. And they very graciously and kindly shared with us, and also in uh, collaboration with the Brattleboro Museum. Don't want to leave out the beautiful Brattleboro Museum. Uh, they allowed us to show you these, photo these uh, uh, images of paintings of your community here in Brattleboro. So we're going to switch over to the next Next thing, I just wanted to say that before we start. So what I want to talk to you about today is the way I do my work. I've been thinking about this for such a long time. Um, I'm an artistic director of a theater company that I started about five years ago, but I've been working in the theater. Oh, shut up now, I know. Uh, 40 years, for about 40 years. And I started out as an actor, and when I had my crise de coeur about, uh, actually crise de coeur, my, my heart movement, about how New York City acting was not for me, when I uh, sort of had a panic attack about going to my fourth callback for a Tampax commercial. And I, I know, and I hadn't eaten anything but gum in about two years, and I was starving, I was so hungry. And I thought, this is terrible, I hate this, I don't even know why I'm doing this. So um, my beautiful boyfriend and I moved to, um, through a couple other little uh, uh, adventures, we ended up moving to Western Massachusetts uh, and uh, lived there, and have lived there ever since in the same house. Met my husband when I was 17 and he was 18 and I was Popeye and he was the devil at the Halloween party freshman year. That's an awesome Popeye, by the way. I had the corn cob pipe. I, I did the. It was awesome. So moving to Western Massachusetts and in this valley that we love so much, I thought I gotta make my own work, because I I I only know how to do the work in the theater, and so I thought I'll be a director. I'll figure that out, and I worked that through, and I thought I only want to do beautiful plays. I only want to direct plays of meaning and beauty. So anytime I directed a show with two dollars in my back pocket and you know somebody's basement, I would find a play that spoke to us, you know, that, that spoke to our times. And I did that for years and years and years and years and years and I loved it, but then I was getting sad. Just sad that I would spend months and months and months on a project and then it would melt away. And I thought, man, I'm just like building these sandcastles and then, psh. So I had a little conversation with myself. We get along fairly well. And I pulled out my yellow pad and I said, well, let's write down the sentence. And the sentence was, I want to make something that lasts. So then I hung around with that for a little while and then a billion synchronicities came together and uh, a, an opera commissioned itself. 
I ended up making my own work. I ended up making a piece called The Captivation of Eunice Williams. And, um, oh, somebody saw it? Holy cow. Oh, oh, I love you. Oh, what's the matter with you people? Oh, thank you. Captivation of Eunice Williams. And that was my first foray into making work that lasted. And I learned a lot in that project. I learned a lot um, from my friend Nick, who helped me write the grant. Uh, and I honed over time these five sort of beacons, my new friend Rachel said to me, they're beacons, uh, uh, that helped me through my work. And, and that has been really a guiding force for me in my work as a, a creator. Um, but it's also really recently, like in the last maybe four years, become a really guiding force in my life. So that's kind of interesting. I just want to slam that out there. That's like a bunt, okay? And um, so now I want to just tell you about my five words in relationship to what you're going to see. You're going to see my dear friend John Shelton and his work, The Red Guitar. So let me just go through the creative process that I go through to create a work like The Red Guitar. I begin with story. Okay, and story for the red guitar was really amazing because it actually is a deeply personal story. It's John Sheldon's personal story through music. Uh, he was a virtuoso guitar player and he made forays into the institution of rock and roll and found that to be a profoundly unsatisfying place, found his way to the valley. And I won't tell you much, I'll actually leave that fairly blank, the story, but we delved into the story an enormous amount before we began. Uh, and for instance, when I did Captivation, the story of little Eunice Williams, a true story, was what we delved into. And the story of the Mohawks who kidnapped her, again, back to Captivation of Eunice Williams, it's a true story, little girl kidnapped by Mohawks in 1704. I had to learn about the Mohawks and learn that story till it was really a part of me. I call that Zen and the Art of. Um, I put that sort of in front of a lot of stuff. And once the story is a part of you, then you can non-attach from that story so that you can see its greater place in the wider world, in the universe, however you want to call that for yourself. But you get to stand back and go, wow, now I get why. That's a story. Okay, so there's first piece. And then second piece, which evolves out of that, is mission. The second word I've got up there is the word mission. And this is one that is, I find, of crucial importance. If once you have found your story, and you've made it Zen in the art of who you are in the world, and you've been able to take a look back at it and see why it's important and why it resonates and why it's archetypal and why it will go right into your heart, then the mission becomes clear. Like the mission for uh, Eunice Williams was really clear. It was about redemption. The mission was to redeem. And when I did, a, I also commissioned another piece called Truth, which was a new American opera about the life of Sojourner Truth. You know, the mission of that piece was so clear. It was to express freedom. It was about freedom. And for John Sheldon's piece, for the red guitar, it is so clear that the mission of the red guitar is healing. And once you, and it's a verb, it's always a verb. And I will tell you that I've also worked on this personally. And my, oh, actually, let's come back to the summit. My mission used to have a lot of words. Actually, it used to be like 10 pages long. Blah, blah, blah. I'm so sick of myself. It's two words now that I want to say to you because it's been my intention to live according to my mission throughout this summit. And my mission is to serve. And I hope Really, in my deepest heart, I've served you guys. So, oh, <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, th but I mean, you know what, I re thank you for that, but I really mean that. You know, that has been my mission. So there's my mission. And the mission of uh, the red guitar is to heal, and you'll have a deeper understanding of what that means as you see the red guitar and feel and hear the red guitar. And then the next word is work. And this is the one where everybody gets all... Um, Ooh, better word, um, messed up, where everybody gets all messed up. 
uh, because uh, there's so many things that can stop you once you get to the work. And the work means many things. It actually is built around the mission. Uh, and I call it, uh, when people say, what do you do, Linda? I say, right to their face, I say, I do whatever it takes. <laughs> so you know, once you have your story, and once you have your mission, you just do whatever it takes. And if it's hard, tough. You just do it. It helps to give yourself a deadline. The beauty of the theater is there's opening night, so you might want to make up an opening night. Um, and so that's always true. I know, that's kind of funny. Um, and so the, but, uh, but now I'll talk about the work um, with John Sheldon. The work has actually been to make a safe place for him. And this is what I love about working in art and in the theater. The work changes drastically uh, and unimaginably every time you do a new project. So I didn't actually have to do a lot of work for John Sheldon because he's the hardest working guy in showbiz, as you'll see. Um, the work that I needed to do for John was to create a safe place so that he could do his work. So we had a lot of conversations about what healing through art is and about what his life has been like. And very fortunately, we, we have some cultural similarities. We both are beat up hippies and you know grew up with a lot of rock and roll. And oh, you were the 80s? Does anybody remember the 80s? I know, vaguely, vaguely. So anyway, we have a shared cultural history, which uh, 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 anthropologically is important and sociologically is important. And so that saved us a lot of time in terms of uh, understanding one another, uh, one another. But we also established that the work in the red guitar is to be vulnerable because we believe very deeply that your power is your vulnerability. And when I get to the word courage, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more. Your power is your vulnerability. And this is a piece about an open heart. This is about being open-hearted, okay? And, and then the other thing that was the work for John was, um, or with John, was trimming it down and getting it true. We had to make it true. We had to use a big word called discernment, which I love as a piece of language, discernment. We discerned what paring it down to the most elemental archetypal thing could be. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you to turn off your cell phone. Turn off your cell phone. Thanks. <laughs> Um, and, the, you know, to get it down to the most archetypal, elemental form. And that took a lot of work, actually. That was really interesting, especially when you're dealing with a life. So, and just to do it over and over again. A lot of times in my world, and I think this is true in a lot of worlds, repetition is a really simple thing in my world, is do it again. And, yeah, and do it again and do it again, and then it becomes a part of who you are, and then you're not afraid anymore. So here comes the next word, here's a really big one. Courage. I love courage. The basis of the word courage is cur. Your heart. Your heart. <clears throat> wasn't going to tell the story. Don't you think I should? I guess I better. Okay, here we go. So last week, I um, was at the New York Presbyterian Hospital on Thursday and Friday uh, donating stem cells in a stem cell procedure to my sister, who is very, very sick with leukemia. She just found out a few months ago. And I'm a match. Get out of town. Shut the front door. So that is a great gift. I, I get to be the guy. So I was really happy about that. It was so great. Scared out of my mind. Absolute chicken shit. Scared out of my mind. But, you know, we're just going to do it anyway. It's like all this stuff. You just do it anyway. So I got there. And by the way, can I tell you the one thing I'm afraid of? And now, by the way, I'm officially fearless. Okay, so not bats, not snakes, not bugs, not death, not traffic. No, 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 no. 
Pshaw, my darling. Pshaw. It's needles. I'm a, such a loser. Oh my God, I'm such a loser. Don't give me a shot. It makes me so scared. Oh, anyway, Jesus, I hate it. Hate myself. And it, but I'm over it. Because the whole thing of stem cell procedure is that they stick a huge catheter-sized needle in one arm and they suck the all of your blood out of you, uh, put it through a centrifuge that's like winding like crazy behind you and, and back of you, swirling your stem cells out of you, and then they, well, there it is. That's it right there, that little purple thing. Um, then they put another one on this side and they put the blood back in you and it goes through you four times. Wow, wow, wow. So I know it sounds disgusting, but you know what? It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. But here's the part that's not beautiful. There's a really lousy part to it, but it's actually really good in the end. Okay, so Stuart Weisenberg, who's 12, maybe 13 years old, is my resident in this... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm serious, he's 12. Stuart Weisenberg says to me, he says, Linda, now this is simply a formality. It never happens. I, I, wanna, I wanna repeat to you, it never happens. But just, just for liability's sake, I need you to sign this consent form because once in, an, in a million times, there is a reaction to the stem cell procedure, and I want to describe it to you. It, it, I know, it's okay, it's okay. Well, actually, it's not, it's gross. But you guys have digested your lunch, you're all right. Um, you will feel numbness on your lip, and then you will lose all sensation throughout your body, and you will go into cardiac arrest. I'm not kidding. So I was like, little Stewball, okay, I'm joking with Stewball, we're good, I'm signing my name. He's like, well, there's a signature. I was like, yeah, hook me up, five and a half hours. This is way not fun, by the way, but it's okay, because it's for Marsha, it's for Marsha, it's for Marsha, it's for Marsha. Five and a half hours into it, I go into something really, really, really bad. I go into the worst pain I've ever been in my life. And Stewball, because he's 12, doesn't understand. So I'm saying, Stewie, Stewie, this is so bad. You need to give me something. And he says, we have Tylenol. And I say, Stewie, you don't get it, you don't get it, you don't get it. So I'm thrashing and crying, but I'll cut it short. Numbness on my upper lip. Stuart, I have numbness on my upper lip, and within 30 seconds it went through my whole body, and I lost all sensation in all of my appendages, and my body started shutting down except my little heart. And I had this image of my heart as a little kid on a tricycle, just like going, like, you're not going to stop me, man, I'm going, this is the longest driveway you ever saw. And, but once I said I had numbness in my lips, Stuart was like, oh, well, perhaps we should abort the procedure. So they pulled all pluggy plugs and all that good stuff. And uh, so that was that. And in an hour, um, I had sensation back in my body. But you know, though, my heart's never been the same, you guys. I have a relationship with my heart now that I never had before. And all that night, I had one other bad thing, that I didn't get enough stem cells that day on last Thursday, so I had to come back on Friday. And I was like, yep, doing it, doing it, doing it. And they said, but Linda, the good news is you will never have this happen again because now that we know that you need extra calcium, we'll be doing bags of calcium. We should be doing a bit of a stew ball. And I was like, yay. Okay, so I come back. But I had a night with my heart. I have a relationship with my heart, you guys. And, and now I'm going to relate it back to, and, and then just after that, it happened again, another seizure, stew ball. I want him dead. <laughs> Ugh. But anyway, no, I'm not dead. It's all good. Um, but what I want to say about that experience is, is that my new relationship with my heart affirms everything I had in my heart for you over the last year as I was creating what I wanted to create, and I didn't know if it would work, and didn't know if it would suck, and didn't know what would happen, but I had in my heart for you that there would be an understanding and a connection in a way that's way beyond your brain. And so I just want to say the cur and courage is awesome. And do not be afraid, because that's just stupid. Because if you do the math, in your cognitive brain, and think of all the things that you 
could be scared of. And I do this with people a lot of times. I go through, like, when people say, oh, Linda, you do these things. That's so cool. How do you do that thing you do? And I say, well, you know, you have a million things. What's yours? What are you going to do, Lyndall Hart? What are you going to do, Martin P Martin Ping's already done it. Boom. Um, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? And they say, well, I'm afraid. And I go, okay, let's just, we're going to do the math. We're going to put it on a spreadsheet. Go through all the things you're afraid of. Go all the way to the bottom. I'm going to beat you to the bottom. Death. You're going to die. So there's nothing in the wet, right? You're going to die. You want, Rachel, you're going to die. <laughs> I mean, that's it. So get rid of the fear. It's a bumper sticker. No fear. Boom. Gone. Courage. And bravery is always, always rewarded, I've found, that when you are brave, then the synchronicities happen. And anybody who's ever done an interesting project, uh, and I'm seeing nods now, anybody that's done anything that they care about, that has story, mission, they've done the work with courage, then you get synchronicity. And then I'm just going to come to my last word, because don't you feel it right now? It's gratitude. And I loved what Martin said today as he wakes up. I do the same thing, babe. I do the same thing every day. I, whatever's going on, I just say, starting with gratitude. And really, you'd have to be a complete butthead not to be grateful. All you have to do is look at anything. If you're stuck in a cubicle, look at your skin. <laughs> look at your toes. Put your hand on your chest. Breathe. And if you're lucky enough to be out of a little box, anything green or blue or golden or white or stone-colored will fill you with gratitude. So don't be a butthead. Just be grateful, because that's the other one that opens up all the channels. All the channels are opened by gratitude. So that's the way I do my work, and I'm going to mosey on away and let me share the work that John Sheldon has done with gratitude with you. And I just thank you guys. How amazing has this been? This has been something. Thank you for this. So there we go. And I'm going to ask my new friend Don, who I love, if he will close the traveler. And in theater talk, that means the big black curtain. And here it comes magically. And now, without further ado, please receive John Sheldon's The Red Guitar. Hello. Hello, my Enjoy. <laughs> All right. You like those, huh? Well, they were made by a very small Peruvian woman. You know, couldn't have been more than four foot eight. But uh, when she sang, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. And I figured I'd better buy a pair of pants from her. <laughs> oh, there's a few, yeah, you know, there's a few. Um, before we, before we get going, I, I wonder if you'd take a few breaths with me. I'm going to take three breaths. Here's the first one. Ready? And this one I'm going to do a sigh. Do a sigh with And this last one, let's do a sigh, and then let's just listen for a second after that. Well, it's silent, relatively silent. They, they say that silence is, is the space that gives music existence. And people that write music and create music often say that they heard the music in the silence. And sometimes there was a muse or some spirit that helped them bring the music into this world from that other world. Well, I don't really know if there is such a thing as silence. 
I mean, even if you get away from civilization, nature is loud. And I've been in places that are really quiet, and uh, I can hear ringing in my ears. And then after that, maybe my heartbeat. And then there's another sound, which is always there in the background. And that, that's the sound of the time that you happen to be living in. In 1954, just about exactly 60 years ago, the United States detonated the first ready-to-use hydrogen bomb. It was nicknamed Castle Bravo, and it was said to be as powerful as 1,000 Hiroshima bombs. The Russians were already working on their own H-bomb, which was 5,000 Hiroshimas. And both countries started mass producing. At around the same time, the spring of 1954, the Fender Musical Instrument Corporation of Corona, California introduced the Stratocaster. <laughs> the Stratocaster, well, what was it really? Sort of an aerodynamic space-age design, and um, it had three electromagnetic pickups hooked up to a switch and some knobs, and on the back, had three springs attached to a block, which was attached to the bridge, which was attached to this little thing you could wiggle. Came to be known as the whammy bar. It really wasn't a highly crafted thing. I mean, the neck is held on by four Phillips head screws. Um, really not much costs about $200. So, right around the same time, you get the H-bomb threatening total annihilation of everything alive, and the Stratocaster. H-bomb, Stratocaster. Doesn't seem like a fair fight. You could say that they were like two poles on a battery. And you could also say that this is where I grew up. <laughs> the first time you might have heard a Stratocaster would have been on the Lawrence Welk show, 1955. There was a regular on the show named Buddy. And uh, he had a Stratocaster that was given to him by Leo Fender himself. So, you might have heard, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a really marvelous musician and a wonderful boy, uh, Buddy Merrill. Okay, Buddy, swing out on that Fender guitar. Uh, this is the best I could do with that. You had to smile if you played Lawrence Well. Around the same time, almost exactly the same time, another teenager named Buddy in Lubbock, Texas, was playing a Fender Stratocaster, Buddy Holly. And he used it differently. He played rhythm on it really aggressively. If you knew Peggy Sue, then you'll know why I feel blue. Oh, Peggy, my Peggy Sue. Ooh, yeah, well, I love you, girl. And I want you, Peggy Sue. And then to play a solo, he'd just flip a switch. And the sound would change. This way of uh, 
playing a guitar in front of a little band, writing your own songs and flipping the switch on it to change the sound was to make Buddy Holly the first rock guitar superstar. And some boys in Liverpool, England were copying him. And everything was going to change. But I was too young to know about any of that. My parents didn't watch Lawrence Welk. They didn't even listen to the radio. Beatles hadn't happened yet. So I learned about music from an activity that I call listening to records. <laughs> Here's how I did it. I take a record. From my parents' small record collection, I'd put it on, I'd sit on the couch, while the music played, I'd stare at the cover. It didn't matter how boring the cover was, because it gave me something to focus on while I listened to the music. Well, the buzzing of the bees and the cigarette trees and the soda water fountain. Well, I have often walked down this street before, but the pavements always stay behind. Well, I'm sad to say I'm on my way. I won't be back for many a day. My heart is down my da 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 on July the second, nineteen fifty-three. I was serving time for armed robbery. Four o'clock in the morning, I was sleeping in my cell. I heard a whistle blow, and I heard somebody yell, there's a riot going on. There's a riot going on. There's a riot going on. Up in cell block number nine. <laughs> How did this record get into our house? <laughs> um, it's pretty cool, though. I think it was a mistake. But... Because every once in a while, my dad usually would buy a record, and it would come into the house in a brown paper bag, a flat bag, and you take the bag off, and then there was plastic, and you worked your thumb in here and did that, and then after you did that, there was paper inside, and, uh, and it usually smelled really fresh, too. And then when you were done with the record, you could... <laughs> kind of put it back in. Well, let's see, here's a new one. What's this one called? The Kingston Trio. Um, <laughs> there's... Three guys on the cover, and there's guitars and a banjo. Well, let's see what this one sounds like. Well, did he ever return? No, he never returned, and his fate is still unlearned. Poor old Charlie, he may ride forever neath the streets of Boston. This is a song about a guy that's stuck on the subway forever. Okay, what's the uh, next song? Is uh, Running like a dog through the Everglades Skipping like a frog through the slimy bog Running through the trees This guy is stuck in the Everglades. <laughs> so, see what the next one is. Uh, Hang down your head, Tom Dooley Hang down your head and cry. Oh, pretty one. <laughs> Hang down your head, Tom Dooley. Poor boy, you're bound to die. Uh, this guy had stabbed his girlfriend and they were going to hang him. Wow. This is really interesting. But then, one day, my father brought home a real guitar. And I took it out of the case. It was enormous. And I sat on the couch, 
And I put on the Kingston trial, <laughs> and, and I played along. I figured out that I could do something that kind of went along with the record a little bit, but then the sound on the record would change, and my sound wouldn't. I heard these little squeaks on the record, and I thought, maybe they're turning the pegs while they're playing. Maybe that changed. There was no way you could do that fast enough. So I put the guitar back in the case. I basically kind of gave up. My dad didn't have much luck with the guitar either. He learned a couple of things, but then he lost interest. So he sold it to a guy named James Taylor. <laughs> now, James Taylor was three years older than me. He was a friend of our family. My two families knew each other. And my dad sold him the guitar and showed him a few things on it. My dad was really, really nice to other people's children. Anyway, my mom, she took action, and she got me violin lessons. Violin was OK. So one day, I saw a reflection of myself in a store window in Harvard Square. A smallish boy wearing glasses, carrying a violin case. Oh, no. I'm not going to be an astronaut. <laughs> or even a pilot. Still, baseball is a possibility. You got to be good at something, or else no one will know you're there. I wish I was good at something Like everyone else seems to be Drive a big ship, dive a double backflip Swim like a fish in the sea I wish I could paint a picture That would make everybody go, ah Know the name of each star, or play a guitar, sing like the Kingston Trial, la di da. Oh boy, summer camp. Smell the pine-scented forest of South Central New Hampshire. It's called Camp Interlochen. It's international. There are kids and counselors here from all over the world. France, China, Japan, India, Kenya, Lebanon, New York. And we sing. After dinner, we get together and sing. The counselors get out guitars and we sing. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. I'd hammer in the evening all over this land. Hammer out danger, I'd hammer out warning, I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the counselor from Kenya, he shows us a song, which is actually a little prayer he tells us, and it means, Come by here, Lord. And the name of the song is Kumbaya. And we sing it without irony. Oh, Lord, kumbaya. And we go in boats out on the lake. And there's a big rock on the other side of the lake. And when we get close enough to the rock, these kids come out on the rock. And they throw things at us. And we hear, interlocking sucks. You suck, faggots. What's a faggot? I asked the counselor in the boat. Ignore them. But why do they hate us? Because they are disturbed. <laughs> well, then maybe, maybe we should sing to them. Kumbaya, Lord, kumbaya. John, sit down.
I'm learning a lot of things at summer camp. I learned how not to wet my bed. It's very simple. When you're in the cabin with all those other boys and it's lights out, you say 10 times, tonight I will not wet my bed. You say this to yourself. And you won't. Just don't forget. I'm also finding out that I got it. I got it. Oh, oh. That I'm no good at baseball. God damn it. I come back the next summer, but it's not the same. I seem to be having trouble staying interested in organized activities. But there are guitars, and you can sign up for a guitar lesson. So I sign up and take a guitar lesson from a man with a mustache and a cowboy hat, and he shows me what to do with my left hand. Three chords. A, D, and E. Oh my goodness, the first time I play an E chord right. Oh, it sounds so cool. And with those three chords, you can play a whole song. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. I'm going to a very liberal camp, but I don't know that. I'm under the impression that singing songs about peace and brotherhood with kids and counselors from all over the world is somehow normal. And there are other chords too, C and G, and the minors, there's A minor, and then, then there's E minor, ooh, that's so deep. And then F, you can climb out of that deep place back to G, and then back into the sunlight with the C. And when I get home from camp, I know how to make a bed with hospital corners, and I know all those chords. And they find a guitar for me in my grandfather's attic, and it's kind of musty and smelly. But I can play it, and I like to stay in my room and play. Where have all the soldiers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the soldiers gone? Uh, what? Oh, we're having company for dinner. It's the tailors. And James is with him, and he's got that guitar that my dad sold to him. And after dinner, he takes it out, and he puts a little clamp on it. And then it's higher. Wow, it sounds like a little music box. One morning, one morning, one morning in May. I spied a fair couple was making their way And one was a maiden so bright and so fair The other was a soldier and a brave volunteer It's so quiet, but so pretty And he's picking out the notes one at a time And you can even hear the melody I wish I could do that. Well, over the course of the next two years, James is going to be at our house a lot because he comes on weekends from his boarding school. And he always has a new song he's learning, and I always get him to show it to me. And that's how I learn how to play Try to Remember. You 
can play everything at once. The bass, the melody, and the chords. Now it's like a little orchestra in a music box. And there's another pattern that he shows me where you can make this little train go. And if you know this pattern, you can play all kinds of stuff. Freight train, freight train, going so fast. Freight train, freight train, going so fast. Please don't tell them when I'm gone. They won't know which train I'm on. Railroad bill, sitting on a fence, trying to make a dollar out of 99 cents. Well, it's right, right, right. For these pastures of plenty, my poor hands have moved. My poor feet have traveled a hot, dusty road. Out from your dust bowl and westward we roll through valleys so hot and the mountains. So cold, you be I O, you be I A. Ghost riders in the yeah, get 'em up, ride 'em in, raw high. Let me tell you something. Once you start playing that cowboy stuff, you just can't stop. I've seen a lot of good men disappear on that endless prairie. <laughs> and there's another song that uh, everybody seems to know in my town, and it's called San Francisco Bay Blues. You can go up to anybody who has a guitar and say, can you play San Francisco Bay? And they'll go, yeah, sure, I can play that song. I got the blues from my baby down by San Francisco Bay. Ocean liner took her so far away. Didn't mean to treat her so bad. She was the best guy I ever had. Said goodbye, made me cry. Only right down and down. Well, I ain't got a nickel and I ain't got a lousy dime. She don't come back, think I'm gonna lose my mind. If she ever comes back to stay, it's gonna be a brand new day. Walking with my baby down by the San Francisco Bay. Well, I went to a party and there was these older kids on the porch and they were playing guitars and mandolins and banjos and I heard them start up this San Francisco Bay and they said, I can play that. So I found a guitar on the couch and I went out on the porch and I started playing along. And there's a part where it stops and you have to play a riff or somebody does. They stopped and they looked at me. So I went. And they started up again. <laughs> oh, then I knew that I knew how to play the guitar. Walking with my baby down by the San Francisco Bay. Well, that was fun, fun, fun. But then one day, everything changed because James brought over an electric guitar. And it was red. And, you know, I mean, really red. Nothing in my house, nothing in my entire life was red like this was red. And it was pretty. And then he started playing it. What is that? That's not folk music. I went to the fortune teller, had my fortune read. Didn't know what to tell her, had an achy feeling in my head. 
Then she looked at my palm Said, son, you feel kind of warm She looked into a crystal ball And said, you're in love I was in love I mean, first of all, what was this? It was just, you slid your finger up and then played another note and then you slide it back down. Well, James said it was blues. Blues. I like this blues. At the end of a couple of months, James said, if you've got $100, you can have that guitar. And I had $100. It was in a metal Band-Aid box from mowing lawns. And now I had an electric guitar, which meant I could play surf music. I could even play a song by the Rolling Stones that was on the radio. It was that same blues thing, but with a different ending, that's all. And there was a new song on the radio by the Guess Who, a, a group from Canada, and that was totally crazy, and it went like this. Shaking all over Wow, it doesn't matter that I can't play baseball Because <laughs> even the ball players wish they could do this I have my revenge Plus, I have an allowance, so I can buy my own records. So one day, I bring home a record. It's by Booker T and the MGs. And I put it on and I hear this. How can three notes sound so cool? And there's a little organ part. And then this lead guitar makes this sound. What is that? It's not even anything, it's just a sound. And then he plays some solo. And 
I play the record over and over again. I get banished to the basement, but I still can't figure this out. It's so simple, but I can't do it. But on the back of the record, it says, Guitar Steve Cropper. And then it gives the address of the record company. It's in Memphis, Tennessee. The street address. So I've got a name and I've got an address. So I write a letter. Dear Steve Cro Cropper, how do you get that sound? It is so cool. I really wish I could do that. But my guitar does not sound like that. What kind of guitar do you use? And what kind of amplifier? Your friend, no. Um, love, no. Um, all the best, signed, John Sheldon. Well, some time goes by, and I get a letter back, and it's from Memphis. And I open it up, and it's on stationery, and there's a little picture of a pile of records, and it says, from the desk of Steve Cropper. And it says, Dear John, I have a Fender Broadcaster guitar, a Fender Esquire, a Fender Stratocaster, and a Fender Telecaster. And for amplifiers, I use, and then he listed all the amplifiers he used, and he said that I generally just plug into whatever is lying around. Thank you for your interest in my work. Your friend, Steve Cropper. What? Wow. But um, whatever is lying around? So it doesn't really matter which guitar or amplifier it is. It's just, uh, so what is it? It must be something else. So I put on the record again and play along with the record. I don't know how many times I go through this, but at some point, something connects with something deep inside me and I know what it is. I couldn't even have the words for it, but I know what this is. And if I had to say one word to describe it, it would be time. It's when things happen, like this. It just has to happen in the right place. Let me tell you, if you can make this sound and you're 14 years old, your life is going to change. Maybe for better, maybe not. And I got a band, baby. We practice in the basement and kids are coming over and I got a reputation. I'm playing at the dances, too. And I'm making out with girls. And I'm even getting paid for playing at the dances, I mean. <laughs> and I've lost all interest in school. I get kicked out of school. But I still got my red guitar. Who cares, man? <laughs> Then a kid steals my red guitar and I can't get it back. But I got a new one from the insurance. <laughs> but 
but there's something going wrong and I don't know what it is but I get so mad that I start shaking and I can't even play I'm so mad I'm mad at everybody I feel like I want to smash everything, even the goddamn guitar. Well, James came over again. And what's this now? He's now my sister's boyfriend my older sister. And he sits at the kitchen table and he plays a song that he says he wrote for her. And it's really quiet. And I can't look away. There's something in the way she moves Looks my way or calls my name Seems to leave this troubled world behind and if I'm feeling sad and blue, troubled by some foolish game, she always knows just how to change my mind. He's been in a mental hospital. He's got scars and cigarette burns all over his arms. But he just wrote a really good song. He seems to have figured out that he can be somebody, even if it's this pale, thin person with scars on him, who plays the guitar and sings really nice. I feel fine anytime she's around me now. She's around me now, almost all the time. And I feel fine. He doesn't look fine. But I wish I was like him. I wish I knew who I was. Well, three months later, I have scars all over my arms, too. My parents are driving me to the mental hospital and driving away. At first, it's kind of a relief. I mean, at least I can just sort of sort out this thing, what's going on? Why do I get so mad all the time? Besides, it's only going to be a couple of weeks. But two weeks turns into a month, and then to three months, and then six months. Six months! What am I doing in this place? These people are crazy! And the word gets back from the doctor in charge while well, you're still in here because you're so mad. Well, of course I'm mad. It's because you won't let me out. But it's really me. I just messed my life up completely, and I don't even know why. I don't know where all this anger comes from. It just wrecks everything. Well, just... To hell with it, man. Let's just play some records. Ah, I got a friend in the hospital. His name's Pete. And Pete's got a lot of records and a record player in his room. And uh, he's got Ray Charles and the Rolling Stones and, and jazz records and even Lenny Bruce records. Really funny, funny stuff, man. And um, I sit in there and listen. We smoke cigarettes and drink coffee. Pete always got a cup of coffee one hand in a Paul Mall and the other. Pete's a junkie. That's what he told me. And he doesn't like bullshit. And whenever he hears bullshit, which is pretty much every day in the mental hospital, he just shakes his head. Well, Pete, what do you got? Well, there's this new record. It's got a yellow cover. And there's this black guy on the cover with feathers on him. And it says, the Jimi Hendrix experience. Are you experienced? 
I'm not really sure they should have let this record onto a mental ward. I mean, there's a song on it called Manic Depression. So, I put on this record, and what's the first thing I hear? It sounds like a giant staggering through hell. And then this riff comes in. It's that same blues riff, but it's all twisted up. And then the chord happens. What is this? It sounds like the H-bomb and the guitar in one place. It says everything about the way I feel. It's in tomorrow or just the end of time. Fifteen months, man. Fifteen months before that doctor decided that I could move back home. I guess that's how long it took me to take this anger and just put it where no one could see it. But I learned things in the mental hospital. I learned how to smoke pot. And without getting caught, which is a different skill set, a whole different. <laughs> and I learned how to play bridge. And I also learned that people are afraid of crazy people. And the reason they're afraid is they're, they're worried that it'll turn out that they're just crazy like them. And guess what? <laughs> I don't really know who's crazy anymore. The doctors seem totally like lunatics. But I'll tell you one thing I know. Everybody is scared. When I get home, I spend a lot of time in my room playing the blues. It's like the blues is like a current. It runs under everything. I turned 17. And I went out looking for a band to play with. Very strange twist of fate. I ended up in an audition for a musician named Van Morrison. Now, Van Morrison had a record out called Brown Eyed Girl, you know. You know, something like that. I could never play that, right? Um, anyways, I tried out and I got the job because Van really loved the blues. 
and I've been playing the blues all winter. So we played gigs around New England, and, and we'd practice and make up stuff together, actually. I was getting into jazz now, because my friend Pete had shown me jazz. I didn't mention that Pete actually did get out of the hospital, but he took um, pills and drank vodka, and he went to sleep, and he never woke up. I had this record that he'd given me by Grant Green, who was a jazz guitar player, and it had this riff on it that went like this. A little melody, it was really cool. I was playing at this little riff at a rehearsal one day. We had a drummer and a bass player, and somehow the rhythm got changed to this rhythm. Anyways. That was kind of interesting. We made a song out of that, and uh, well, after about six months, Van got another recording contract, and he moved down to New York City to make a record, and I was decided that I'd finish high school. I went and found another band to play in. It was called The Bead Game. I really didn't like the name of the band, The Bead Game. It sounded like a hippie thing, but the musicians were really good. They were mostly from Berkeley school music and uh, the drummer was absolutely fantastic and about a year later we were in New York making our own record at the record plant and on the schedule it said eight o'clock to one o'clock in the morning bead game and two o'clock to whenever Jimi Hendrix I was sitting in this little lobby and Jimi Hendrix walked in and he had a guitar strapped to his back and he went into the studio but he left the door open and I saw him take the guitar out and he started just warming up. was not Purple Haze. It was, um, I didn't even really know what it was. It was all these things at once. Couldn't really define it. And then there was these sounds in there. It sounded like a big space opening up in front of me. skip ahead because nine months later there wasn't any more Jimi Hendrix and there was no more beat game either we made two records and nobody bought them and our band was breaking up and the drummer in the beat game was joining a new band that was forming called Steely Dan and I kept hearing this song on the radio 
I didn't know I'd be hearing this song on the radio for the next 40 years. And James? He was becoming some kind of mellow rock star. Well, I don't remember much about the year I turned 21, actually. I just remember feeling like I'd been left behind somehow. I remember that I had a whole bunch of pot in a Quaker oatmeal container. And I remember watching a lot of Boston Bruins hockey whilst stoned. Well, I became 21, and I went to California. I went to LA. It's all sort of a cliche now, what I did. I went to LA, went to Hollywood, was a guitar player there for a while, then I went to San Francisco, I was in a house with a band, we all took LSD, it just goes on and on. And there's interesting things about it, but I'm going to gloss over them right now. And, you know, get into the time machine, the time-o-meter, and go forward to being 30 years old, going on the road with Linda Ronstadt, and then realizing that rock and roll and pop music had become just another organized activity with its own rules, its own conventions, its own expectations. We knew how well I did with that kind of thing. <laughs> there didn't seem to be anything left to do. So I went to music school. Music school. Man, what, that's a great idea. Here, I could learn about something I really cared about. I felt so lucky. There was all these departments. Classical music department, Baroque music department, jazz department, composition department, early music department. Which one do you want to be in? All of them. I want to know it all. Well, I was married by now. I had a little girl, another one on the way. Had to drop out a couple of times to work carpentry job. But at the end of five years, I stood on that stage and got my degree. I was so happy and so proud. And I was almost completely cured of my love for music. Boy, they got that figured out. You take a piece of music that makes you feel like you're a flower bending up towards the sun, and you pick it apart, and it dies. Then you're doing an autopsy, and you cite established references from musical scholars and put it all in a paper. I wrote so many papers, and you hand the paper in, I got really good grades. And you walk by practice rooms where the, full of pianos and all these students are hammering away on the pianos for the competitions that they're going to have to enter like it's the Olympics. All those notes swarming like insects. Well, I got my own music school. 
So we're going to do my music school just for a moment here. At my music school, the first thing you do is you master one thing. And that thing is one note. You learn to listen to one note. It starts and then it fades. And just about the time that that note disappears and you're not sure if you're hearing the note that was played or the one in your head, that's when the door is open. The door to the world where the music comes from. And that became my job. To find that door and to help some music come from the other side into this world. And I found out very quickly that very few people were interested in this. But I was. And now, it doesn't matter who's interested. Because even if I'm the only one that hears it, the sound of that door opening is everything to me. Well, after music school, I found that I was still playing in bars. I was playing at weddings, because what people actually wanted was stuff that they knew. And whenever I tried to do something original, I just couldn't make a go of it. So I was playing all kinds of strange places, country bars, punk music, um, general business, uh, playing all of me and stuff like that. It was all, it was all pretty good. But um, I uh, said, I turned 40 and I had two children, and I said, that's it. There's no place for me in this business of music. I've tried. I'm 40. I quit. So I moved out to the country to a farmhouse, and there was horses and grass. And it was amazing. It was like I was always what I'd always wanted to do. But it, came, it became apparent to me after a time that the depression that came from my youth was still in me. And I would get in very dark and black moods. And I went to a doctor, and he said I was depressed. I had clinical depression. And he prescribed pills. And I took the pills, and I started to feel better. But after a few years, the pills didn't work anymore. And I kind of tried all these different combinations, and I tried stopping. When I stopped taking the pills, I just felt so horrible. And so um, I was reading on the surfing the web, and I saw an article about ayahuasca, a medicine in Peru. It was all over South America, really. And it seemed really great, but I didn't know how to go and I didn't know who to talk to. It, the article talked about serotonin, which was a uh, problem in depression. You don't, supposedly don't get enough serotonin in your brain or something like that. Anyway, I eventually went to Peru. And I was in a round hut with a thatched roof. There was about 20 other people in there. And it got dark. And there was just one kerosene lantern. And there were some shamans. And they had shakers made out of leaves. And they started shaking their rattles.
and out in the jungle I could hear sounds. There was a frog out there for one thing. And other sounds of creatures I couldn't identify. There was, there was one th sound that sounded like somebody was laughing at all of us. I really like that one. And after about 45 minutes, they turned the lantern out and we drank the brew of ayahuasca. It was extremely bitter. Some people started to throw up. And then I began to feel like I was on a wave of energy, riding a wave of energy. And I saw myself as a being made of pure energy. It was beautiful, and it was terrifying, and a little bit nauseating, but I wrote it. And when I lay on my back, light spilled out of my body into the blackness, and whole worlds were being created from the light from my body. Entire universes, galaxies. And then a voice sounded inside my head saying, we could show you this all night long, but I think you came here for another reason. And I said, yes, I'd like to see my depression. And instantly, I saw a coiled serpent-like thing inside my chest. It shared body parts with me. My lower ribs were its wings. Help! Help! A face floated toward me in the dark. It was brightly illuminated. It was the face of Sigourney Weaver from the Alien films. Now that makes sense. Ripley, I've got one of these things in my chest. What do I do? She said, relax. It will come out soon. I have experience with this kind of thing. But I don't want it bursting out through my chest. It's OK, she said. That was only a movie. And it was a movie about what a lot of people are scared of what's inside their own chest. So just look in there and see what's in there and love it because love is the only transformational power in the universe. She drifted away. I had other experiences that night traveling through the cosmos and then suddenly, I felt something release and fly out of the top of my head with a rustle of leathery wings. And I said, thank you. I realized whatever that was, it had been my friend. It had been my ally. It had protected me. And the only reason that it had gone was because we both knew in that moment that we just didn't need each other anymore. And I felt this amazing emptiness. And I had this realization that the emptiness and the silence is full. There was a cricket. It was up in the ceiling, up in the leaf roof. My ears were drawn to this cricket sound, which seemed to me to be perfection, like a little carving of the air.
It was merging with the other sounds of the jungle, like everything could hear everything else. My cricket is an artist, a being totally true to itself, making a perfect sound. cricket spirit knows I'm listening to it and sends its song down the curling spiral of my ear. It's astounding me, making me want to laugh out loud. I have no idea where the cricket spirit leaves off and I begin, but that's okay because no one else does either, no matter what they say. I know what I'm hearing, and in that moment, I am home. got home. I stopped taking those pills and I haven't taken one since. I still sometimes get depressed, but it doesn't live inside me. And I know it as an old friend now, not as something to be hated. Life's different for me now. It's a little bit simpler. It's easier to find out where my heart is. And it's easier for me to talk to the muse. So before I go, I want to tell you about my interaction with the muse. It happened in sort of a dream, a waking dream. And it wasn't what I expected. I saw a window and a counter. It looked like something you might see at an auto parts store. And there was a bell on the counter. And I rang the bell. And this little guy appeared behind the counter. What do you need? And I said, you're the muse? <laughs> John, what do you need? I did not expect this. I thought it would be sort of more angelic, maybe with a harp. John, I'm ephemeral. 
I could vanish at any moment. What do you need? <laughs> well, um, okay. I got this uh, tune, and it just doesn't go anywhere. I mean, it starts out good, but it just doesn't develop. Go ahead, play it. That's it? Yeah, that's all I have. I see a problem. You played an F sharp, an A, and a D. That's a uh, major triad. You, you don't start a melody with a major triad. It's like moon, moonbeams, rainbows, sunshine. You're all done. Well, what would you do? C sharp. Play a C sharp and then play the D. Go ahead. C sharp and then a D. Okay. C, yeah, C. So first the F, the A, C sharp. Oh, that's an F sharp minor triad first inversion. Don't get technical. Just feel it. Okay. Uh, oh, shadow. Shadow. It feels like a shadow. And then play the D, right? Light. Shadow. Light. And now it's got momentum, John. Now it wants to keep going. That's right. It wants to keep going. So let's see. Where does it go? It goes shadow, light. It wants to fall back into another shadow and then climb out of that one and then climb up towards the fourth the sound of transcendence <laughs> and then it's strong enough to make the leap all the way up to a B but it falls and keeps falling all the way back down If this is like real life, then we just have to start over. Just have to do it again. So we start shadow, light, fall back into shadow, climb out towards the fourth. Make the leap up. But we fall again? This can't be happening all the way back down. Oh, I definitely couldn't do that again. I'd be too tired. So we go to a bridge. A bridge is like a vacation. Another melody. Maybe going to another key. Maybe it winds its way up. When it arrives at a suspension. But we know where we're going. We've got to go back to the beginning again. But this time, we've got the knowledge and the wisdom to hear it like we're hearing it for the first time.
I like it. Nice, John. So uh, that's been you, huh? Helping me all these years with the melodies and the harmonies and the songs. And You're thinking about this thing too literally, John. It was me or whoever else was on that day. <laughs> hey, you know, it could have been the, uh, the grass, the birds, stars. Could have been a friggin' cricket. Okay, so did I actually write anything? Or was it all you guys and the birds and the crickets and the stars or whatever? Yeah, we usually work that 50-50. <laughs> so, uh, what's wrong with your shoulder? Oh, this. Oh, I, I store a lot of my tension up here. I need to get to a masseuse or a chiropractor. So, uh... Am I going to be famous now? That's a different window. <laughs> but uh, you, you weren't that interested in that anyway. You were just looking for some truth. Well, what should I do now? now you could share. You could uh, let people know what's in your heart. Well, isn't that kind of dangerous? I mean, people might call me names, or they might say I'm a new age weirdo, or, 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 or I could be sacrilegious. Yeah, wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> Besides, they'd only be talking about themselves. You make everything sound so simple. It is. I mean, people want to complicate it, but uh, hey, I got a question for you. How the Red Sox doing? Oh, the Red Sox. The Red Sox, uh, not too good right now, but they won the World Series. You gotta be friggin' shitting me. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and not only did they win the World Series, they won it three times in the last ten years. I gotta get out more. <laughs> so, uh, you've been working hard, huh? Yeah, I've been working double shifts. See, they got this new idea. Uh, they think that scientists can't save your world. Theologians can't. So they're thinking about giving the artists a shot. <laughs> well, I just got one more question then. Why a red guitar? Because, John... We needed to get your attention. Well, thank you for yours. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. That was really beautiful, John. That was awesome. Right? How about that? How about that? How about that, Orly? Do you want to say anything? Here we go. Well, I was just going to um, open it up for questions or conversation or here we are in this space and we've got like nine more minutes of our really? slow living summit. And did you want to say something just before the end, Orly? I just want to say that up the street... Everyone has been working really hard to prepare the most amazing agricultural Mardi Gras for you. The street is closed. It's a huge celebration. It's a real representation of our slow living community that's going to move up the street with a lot of music, a lot of good feeling, and a lot of community. And I want to thank you, John. It was just amazing listening to you. The red guitar also has something to do with the red thread of the mm -hmm. community that was here. Yes, it did. Yeah, and yeah. you really brought community oh. to <laughs> this whole session from the first from the first session on Wednesday night till tonight. And I want to thank every one of you. The red thread that Linda gave us all, we're all connected. 
I don't think any one of us sitting here today who witnessed this incredible, incredible conference that really showed us about giving back and about how important the arts are to the community will ever, ever forget that. And this red thread will be my reminder. And I want to thank everyone here, this community that's part of my community now. And I want to thank Linda, John, all the other speakers, and Martin, I don't even see you. Where are you? Come over here, Martin. Come over here. And I want to do it in theater style, because I never do that. How do you do it? Oh, here we go. And now, take a bow. <laughs> and, and I want everyone, because you deserve a bow. So one, two, three. <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next year. And please come up the street. It's a huge celebration at our glass barn, which is the new home of the Strolling of the Heifers. There's incredible spirits, as well as vendors, and our bread spirits. pudding contest. And you get to vote and taste. So join us. And of course, tomorrow is our incredible Strolling of the Heifer Parade and Festival. Uh, be there. There's a lot of pre-parade um, entertainment. Uh, it starts 10 o'clock sharp, as well as afterwards. There's a lot of um, uh, vending and fun at the uh, commons and the retreat. And Sunday, there's a breakfast at the marina. You can then motor to the various farms that are open, or if you're more athletically inclined, come to our Tour de Heifer which is a family bike ride, or you can do a hike, and it goes from farm to farm. There's a great lunch and music, and it's a real celebration of sustainable agriculture and celebrating our local farmers. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>